All right. <laughs> so I will say it's, it is tricky. I'm very used to talking to people face to face. And, um, and just so you know, yes, I'm in my workwear and I like showered and got dressed and did my hair and I, I worked for this. So just hopefully somebody who knows me is laughing out there. So uh, we're going to get started. And I will um, remind people that I have two dogs. And though that this is usually quiet time, no promises, if some noise happens. Um, and I wanted to, sh to say thank you uh, for, tuning for tuning in today. Um, the team, uh, the en energy and environmental stewardship team that's putting this particular stream of webinars together, um, we are grateful for your attendance and we are trying to take something we love to do face to face and our young professionals on our team, our newer members are amazing. Um, myself, I can't say that about technology. Uh, we are, uh, Extension is used to face-to-face. -face. Historically, we went, you know, to backyards and farms and we now meet in different places for uh, master naturalist training and master gardener trainings and such. So this is a new thing. It will continue, but we will be back to you with face-to-face -face programming uh, when we are allowed. I want to thank everybody who's on here that are my friends, family, and all my master naturalists I saw listed. You guys are amazing for joining us. Um, and you know, one day we'll get it back together. So we're going to go right into this program. And I would like to share with you that this is um, a typical uh, extension program in that it is an objective view at many sides of the coyote um, as a mammal, as our one of our larger mammals uh, in the state, one of our most active hunters. Uh, and it's the goal is for you to just have more information to share with others, to feel comfortable that research is being done all the time so we know what, what is going on with those um, brilliant beasts. You will hear my opinion, but the information I share will be, uh, will be and is research-based. And I hope that uh, by the end you, you recognize that there's a lot of sides to this situation. I don't call it a controversy. Um, I don't care to. It's an animal that's lived here and doesn't have a clue that we even care, right? So that first slide, um, there will be, that link will be presented at the end. We truly uh, would, uh, would appreciate some responses to our surveys for our webinars. It helps uh, guide us in this new endeavor of webinaring and not our face-to-face -face time. So we'll go ahead and I'm going to make an attempt to get going here. Let's see if it works. There we go. Um, so I, when I did this program initially, somebody said, wow, clever title. <laughs> I said, well, it was done on purpose. Um, as people know, the way I present, there's a little bit of everything from stories to, and the research is the base of it all. But we, when we hear about coyotes, we often hear it in such a detrimental way or a fearful way or um, an, a way that makes us uncomfortable. I just wanted it to be about coyotes, Canis latrans, our largest canine mammal. I didn't want it to be exciting um, and overwhelming. So I wanted it simplified and not worked up. Um, and today I'll share some, experience, um, some experiences, some research, the role of this animal in your life and your role in its life. Uh, you might hear a few pieces of uh, stories, maybe literature, if you're so lucky. <laughs> so there's three Illinois canids, right? Um, they all look very similar. They have a few different uh, distinctions in color and where they prefer to uh, pick as home, a habitat. But that's pretty much their list. They're, they have long pointy muzzles compared to a Coyotes and wolves, especially in a winter coat, a coyote can look pretty thick, but their nose tends to have this pointy taperedness to it, whereas a wolf's muzzle is kind of like my Malamute. It's a firm, long, you know, column nose, um, and that's often, often the giveaway. The ears are erect. They've got those bushy tails, all that to keep them warm, and if you'll notice the, the four toes on the, the hind foot, and there are five toes on the front foot, even of your dog, um, but if it has a dew claw, that's that fifth foot. Uh, we call that a, a non-registering toe in the track. So each track's gonna look like it has four toes, but the animal actually does have five toes on that, on that front foot. 
Here's our two foxes in Illinois. They're adorable. A good distinction between the red and the gray for starters if it's going past you because some of our gray foxes can have um, lots more red on it than that particular animal on the right. But look at those stockings. The, the red fox, whether it's light colored, dark colored, it's gonna have that really nice black stockings on its legs. I actually saw a fox in the backfield behind my house a few years ago. Size-wise, it was as tall as our coyotes that, that work the field back here, it's more slender. I've never seen a fox that tall, but those black stockings didn't even have to second guess um, that it was a, a red fox. The gray fox, if you notice, it looks a little more cat-like in the face, although on the run you wouldn't maybe notice that, and there's good reason for that. The gray fox, unlike the red fox and the coyote, the gray fox prefers to hunt in the forested areas, in the trees, and its main diet uh, often is birds. It can climb a tree just like a cat. They're lightweight, their paws could fit on a quarter most of the time, and their paws are a little bit different. I'll talk about this when we, show, if we, get, when we get to the tracks. Their paws are a little bit different. They're built a little more cat-like in the main pad, giving them probably a little more grip making it easier for them to go up so they don't compete, whereas our red foxes and coyotes are at constant competition in our open rural spaces. There's the, there's the ones and onlys. There's my pictures of that I was able to pull up with different coyotes. There are different colors in these coyotes. I've seen almost black coyotes. Later you'll see a photo of a nearly gray-white coyote, but that's a pretty standard uh, color and coat right there. The one on the right, that's really typical of coyote behavior when they just sit and look and nothing makes humans call me faster than a coyote sitting in the yard or just outside of their yard just looking at them or looking at their house. They're very inquisitive. They're very intelligent. Um, one of the reasons I love them so much is they can solve things. Not everybody likes that. A lot of times us as humans don't like things that are smart and it makes us nervous and that's based on a very true deep value of our safety but really he doesn't know you care i had a gentleman come into my nature center one year he walks his dog to this day on the same trail every day and he said peggy there's a coyote out there in that little dip in the in that upland trail and every day i go by he just is looking at buddy and i I said, what? He said, what do you suppose he's thinking? I said, I don't have a clue what he's thinking, Mike. I said, do I need to do something about that? Would, are you concerned? He said, no. He just sits down and looks at me and he looks kind of sad. And I said, well, it's late March, early April. I can't remember exactly when. I said, well, his wife's at home, four to six puppies, 10 or 12, if, you know, if they did so well. And his job is to get more food and he's exhausted. And he kind of probably wishes he was on a leash like Buddy and being well cared for. And I said, but if anything happens, it goes awry, let me know. But really they just are inquisitive. So today I'm gonna go over why coyotes. Um, we're kind of talking about that already. Overview of wildlife values, which is critical and something I want you to um, as a, as a takeaway, because then when you talk to people or hear people telling you about coyotes, you'll understand that everyone has different values when it comes to this. We'll do a little bit of their physiology. I will show you some of the research that's out there. Laws and regulations for those who uh, want that information, how to manage them, what we can expect. If I could tell you, I would. I mean, but there are some possibilities. And then what is your role in their lives? There will be time at the end for me to answer some of the chat questions, but with the number of people, registered today. Um, it, it will be difficult to get to all of those. I want you to know that, but you're always welcome to email me with questions or conversation I would love to have. So we're going to start out with why coyotes. And I, I've shared this with my master naturalist before. Those of you who are out there, um, I apologize for the repetition. Uh, this, is, this is what coyotes represent to me. One, I love circles. But as people in your environment, even if you didn't know where this was, think about all the things that you could learn from this. One, there's a canine track, okay? In this case, it does happen to be coyotes, but you have a leaf that fell off of a tree and it had such a firm bend in the stem that it stuck. That firm bend is because it came from a species of tree that would have held onto its leaves longer than others into the winter, say maybe an oak, right? And it hung there 
until the wind broke it at the scar and dropped it on, and this happens to be on a frozen pond, and it stuck. And so now where you could break, bring this down to an, a region, you know this isn't Florida. This icy cold snow is crusty, it sat there, it's gotten harder. And look at the wind, the wind is blowing because the leaf has made that perfect circle. And the coyote the, is, is standing, he stopped. This thing has turned a circle, turned a circle. And look at those front feet. Well, one's a back foot, but for now, look at those feet touching that bottom right part of the circle. He, it's a he, it's a male. He stood there long, and I'm not that good at tracking, I'll explain why. He stood there until his feet melted to the substrate. And he watched it go around and around. And then in true coyote fashion, he direct registered and his right hind foot stepped into that right track and made a right hind foot track. The other right front foot is out of the picture, but the left front foot is right at the top of that circle. And he's a lefty, he urinated on there just to make sure that that thing making all that motion knew who really knew what they were doing. That's coyotes, they're observant, they watch, they think, and they often have a reaction. Sometimes they are known as the jokester in Native American literature, and this might be one of those examples. Wildlife values. This is really critical in all wildlife. I also do a large predator program, and that's where I, it, the, the values portion started in my two presentations. We have to understand that in a room of people, there are gonna be many different values, many different values based on experiences. You may have never encountered a coyote except in photos and think they're beautiful. Where a person sitting not too far from you may have had a chicken taken. Um, they do take one and go. They don't tend to, to annihilate the pen, but that's going to cause a different value and we have to honor those values. So primarily, like I said in the beginning, our number one value always no matter what animal you are, is your safety. You will defend yourself when necessary to protect yourself. In current times that we are now, we might have to go out and get something. We've become very protective of our person. Coyotes do that every day. They look at the landscape, they're prepared, they're concerned. We see a coyote go by, we might get concerned because of our safety. Also, we may have an interest an innate want to preserve these charismatic wildlife, right? These beautiful animals, that's a value. We need um, to manage coyotes and we may need to manage them for their health of the ecosystem. That's a hard one for some people that we would have to eliminate some animals in order to make a, a, a population healthy. It's a hard concept, which may include large predators, right? Not bringing them in. We can't make them come here. We can't make them stay here. We have no gate on the state, but we don't have the top of our food chain. We have no wolves. We have no bears. We have no cougars other than ones that are wandering in and out. We don't have a complete food chain in Illinois. The top is missing. And that makes a, a complete ripple effect. We don't always notice. Um, we need to think about that because later we're gonna talk about how we manage those animals. I'm gonna ask forgiveness for this next slide because of how much writing is in it. If you were in a program with me face-to-face, -face, I would say ignore the slide and look at the half page handout I just sent you. But for this, I'm afraid we have to look at it this way. You may not be wanna read every word, you don't have to. But Keller and Smith in 1996, two two um, wildlife uh, guys came up with these values that you can apply to any wildlife situation, okay? And there's nine of them, and you can be all of them, you can be some of them. The utilitarian, um, that, that practical material exploitation. My first college education uh, from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, I have to always shout that out, um, was in wildlife management. But this was in the early 80s, back when wildlife management was to manage groups of animals. I happened to study fur-bearing mammals, and they were managed with hunting and trapping, which allowed families to collect food for their family, sell pelts, and have additional income back when there was income in pelting. That's when I studied wildlife management. That would be a utilitarian. I, someone who goes out to legally hunt 
trap in order to feed their family and or bring in extra income to sustain their life. Naturalistic, experience, exploration, um, the uh, ecologistic, scientific, that's your sciencing, that's your studying of, that'll be in the research portion we talked about. Aesthetic, physical appeal and beauty. Um, symbolic, a lot of the Native American language, uh, they actually had that study with that, that's, that the number of pieces of coyote literature is insane. So they've been on this landscape a long time. They've made a huge imprint on people in different levels of human population, and they're still here. Humanistic, strong emotional attachment. I'll say that I've had that experience. Moralistic, spiritual reverence, ethical concern for nature, maybe the balance of nature. Uh, the dominionistic, mastery, physical control, dominance of nature, uh, and negativistic, fear, aversion, alienation from nature. Those last two are not negative. Those are true values and possibly created by an experience, something that was read, something that happened, or this need to have that control. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I keep getting squiggles, <laughs> some weird squiggles on my screen. I don't know what's happening there. So name these values, okay? Pardon the 1980s, I got the chance to, um, had the chance to work with a coyote that had imprinted on people and couldn't be released. He liked two people and I happened to be allowed to be one of those two people. And it allowed me a face-to-face, -face, uh, hands-on interaction with him. We named him Smiley. Okay, it doesn't help these animals that they grin because then they show their teeth and then people freak out when they do, they grin. When they get happy, excited, it's very different than a snarl. If you, if you see both, you would know. The other one is a naturalistic. I got to study his behaviors um, and that was, that was the highlight of my uh, apprenticeship I did down in Land Between the Lakes in Kentucky. Uh, forgive the 1980s clothes and hairdo, but look at all these interactions. So am I afraid of coyotes? Yeah, if I'm out by myself and I'm concerned about their behavior. If they're acting like a coyote and doing their thing, I am not afraid at all. But I am, my first and number one is safety, right? So if he turns and starts walking toward me, now we have an issue that we have to think about. So it's, you can have multiple values. This uh, particular photo, uh, that's not moralistic. And the only reason I put it up there, it's not to, to harm your heart. There's not a single coyote that sees this and changes their mind about doing anything. They don't understand that. This is a human that thinks by doing that, it'll ward off a, a coyote. The coyotes, who knows, maybe they just don't understand why so many of their kind can't jump the fence. This makes, this makes no difference to the species. So what makes a coyote? Oh my goodness, they are not as big as they look um, because they, they average about 35 pounds. They can be up to 42 pounds has been uh, weighed in. Um, but they're just an average, they're kind of like a, a border collie on stilts uh, as far as their abilities. They can run like a border collie up to 43 miles an hour, which is pretty, it's pretty impressive. The ups man gets pretty excited about that, I'm sure. 23 to 26 inches at high at the shoulder, they can be taller than that, but their fur is a huge additive to size. Their colors vary. Um, they have beautiful green eye shine. It's the greenest green of eyes lighting up at night. I have this uh, rescued Malamut in my house. And when they call in the back field, he gets so excited. So I let him out because nothing's going to, you know, they're not going to attack him. Um, he wants to go out and howl with them. So he gets out the door and they're all yip, 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 yip. You know, every coyote sounds like three coyotes. So if you say, I think I have a dozen coyotes, you probably have four, right? They just, they make so many different conversational sounds. The, he, they yip, 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 yip. We let him out, he lets one deep guttural wolf-like howl and they just, yup, they go silent. And then of course my adult son and I, who just graduated from college, we have nothing better to do in our social life. So we run out with flashlights and shine in the field and there's all these little green blinky lights because they have no idea what the heck just landed in the, in the yard behind the field. You know, they just heard it and they head off toward the jewel, probably to go shopping, I suppose. So the total length looks long because a third of their body is that long bushy tail, which as most of you probably would recognize, keeps them safe in the winter when they curl up. They only den to have young for that month that those babies, those pups are in the den. They might den up in the winter if they find one and it's a really severe winter, but that tail is their protective circle when they, when they sleep at night. 
they're good swimmers. They don't mind the water and 90% of their diet typical as we would think are rodents and rabbits, depending on where you live. Here in Illinois, a lot of rodents and rabbits during uh, fawn drop, deer season, uh, when the fawns are dropped, if they come across a fawn, they are not passing that up. But a newborn fawn doesn't have active scent glands for three weeks. So a coyote literally has to fall over that animal, like just land on it to find it because it's not going to have a, a scent uh, to locate it with. But they will. And in uh, when I was in undergrad, I helped the graduate students who were studying fawns. We put radio collars on fawns and we would find occasionally it was my job to get out because coyotes, interestingly enough, like to defecate on flat surfaces like gravel roads. So the van would stop and I would knew, know that was my job. Ugh. I had to go out and scoop up coyote poop so they could study what they ate. And every once in a while, you'd find a little fawn hoof in there. And I thought and I said one time, I said, well, now we know why they howl. They have to pass a full fawn hoof. It can't be comfortable. Here's the hunting style of a coyote. There is a major difference between wolves and coyotes, and this is probably the biggest one. If wolves could laugh at coyotes, they would laugh at this because these guys hunt more like our smaller canids, like our foxes, and that's their typical hunting style, right? Not that they won't run after a rabbit or try to chase something down. They usually don't go after uh, animals that are larger than them. Um, there's a deer, the fawn is much more their style than a full-size deer. And if, it, unless a deer is compromised, they might try to tackle it as a, as mom and dad in their family group. But really most of their diet is going to be, um, hunted in this style, which is pretty comical. I put this picture in here and now he was already shedding his coat. This was the animal at, at Land Between the Lakes, but look how much bigger he looks with his coat so thick. He was only 37 pounds in that picture. And there's a big whiskey barrel that he's laying on, but they're much lighter than they look. We get, we, we get excited when we see them, we get concerned, our eyes make them bigger. Um, but doesn't mean we still don't have to be cautious. I'm just trying to put in perspective how big they actually are. This is a fuzzy photo. Um, I picked it up off of Michigan Department of Natural Resources website, and I think I've seen it a million other places, but I wanted to point out to you that those, um, the dog tracks, and actually I picked this because they, they used a coyote print, those two toes, that's a hind track right there of, a, of, a, of what would be a canine or coyote on the left, the toenails. I now with this large predator program that I offer, I use this because the cat tracks don't have um, don't have the nails. They have the retractable claws. Their toolbox needs to stay safe until they need it. Um, there are there's research out there that one broken claw or a broken canine on a mountain lion and it reduces their success for survival um, greatly. Also notice the toes. So your fingers on your hand are set more like a cat. If you look at, if you hold your hand up and you're looking at the top of your hand, you've got that uh, stair step effect and then back down on your toe. It's a lot more like a cat than a canine whose middle two are even right there. Okay, just some fun things to think about when you're out. If you see a track like that on the right and it's the size of a quarter, somebody's cat's running around outside. If you see that track and it's the size of the palm of your hand, you probably need to go the opposite direction depending on the age of the track. <laughs> So I threw this one in because again, I love to, I love to try to figure out the stories. So this is a, a border collies will do this. Some of our, our working dogs can do this, but notice the, what we call direct register. It's not a two legged animal. He's not running on just two legs. He's direct registering hind lay, hind feet land into front feet. So when you're tracking something that direct registers, you're looking at the hind footprint over the top of the front footprint. And if you notice, this one's getting a little sloppy. The print isn't perfect, but also notice there's a, there's a toenail drag every step. He could be injured. He could be sick, most likely, because it was early in the, in the day. It's probably exhaustion from running around hunting, but there's a lot of information when you start looking at the different things that animals leave behind. So, well, here's the distribution of your coyote. <laughs> so they have, as we've industrialized, they've moved with us. We have created the best coyote habitat in the world. And everywhere we go, we build up our human population, which builds up our 
our intake and our waste. And if, you know, when you look at coyotes, the, the portion of their diet that's garbage is like 1%. It's barely there. People think they're garbage eaters. No, they're rodent eaters. And when you have garbage, you get rodents and small animals that want to eat it and you attract these animals. Doesn't mean they won't eat garbage. One of the best ways to tell if um, a coyote or even in this case, my rescued Malamute uh, has eaten a lot of garbage are um, the carbohydrates in our food, it eats their enamel. And then you'll start to see the dentition, the dark spots down in their teeth. So if a wild coyote is captured and they look at their teeth and they see that it's very decayed, it's a very big possibility that they are not well and depending more on garbage than their ability to hunt for food. But yeah, we've kind of created it. And our urban settings are, are a, an amazing space to raise families if you're a coyote and have plenty of rodent and uh, small game because of our actions. So this is just the coyote family. Now, one of the things that everybody uses it, they use the word pack, all the scientists use it. I personally prefer family. You will have an alpha female, alpha male, basically mom and dad, and you will have pups born each year if they're, if they're lucky. And they will sometimes carry over a female uh, interesting to me that it's you, it's gender, it's a female, and they may have a family of three. The pups come, and the reason they kept that female is to act as a babysitter. When you're feeding pups, they had a record I found somewhere that there were one litter was 19. That's not typical, right? Four to six is typical, but but having a third adult on board gives the chance for one to stay and keep an eye on those on those pups. Why two get to hunt? Because they're gonna capture food, regurgitate it until they're eating uh, meat at about three weeks. They come out of the den at after a month, you know, now their eyes are open and they can, they can start chewing on meat and doing all their grown up activities as little people. But you have this coming up soon, you will start to hear the coyotes a lot more. One, they can talk a lot more. The babies are bigger, right? That's safer. Two, they're out hunting and they have to find each other. So often you'll hear a howl, an independent howl, after, you know, after it's been maybe dark for a while. By the way, they do come out during the day. They're not sick because they come out during the day. These animals are diurnal and nocturnal, and when they're hungry, they want to eat. They do tend to hide, which would be our daytime, but they can be out during the day without being rabid. So going back, if you hear that one call, you'll often hear another call. And then you'll wait, and you'll hear a third call. This is going to be happening in May probably a lot. That third call is that babysitter saying, I'm right here, they're hungry, please get back and bring everything with you. So they're making sure they can find each other because once the puppies are moving, the babysitter might actually move around with them a little bit. And they need to find each other, say, hey, I've got food, yeah, me too, okay, let's bring it back. Um, I always compare them to kind of like the Waltons because at night when one talks, the other talks, then they all talk and then they all get quiet. Um, it's pretty interesting if you're not frightened and can just sit and kind of think about all those things. All right, we tried this and it worked. I'm gonna try it again. Aaron will let me know uh, if it doesn't work. This is a video, I don't think it's up anymore. The best coyote research and that I have ever found, and it's going on in Cook County, um, is the Urban Coyote Research uh, Project. So you can find it, I put it up there, Herb, just put, and if you just put Urban Coyote Project into Google, you'd find it. And the website has been updated. It's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful website, but it keeps you up to date on all the field work they're doing. Um, they've been doing this since uh, 2000. And this is a small window into their spring uh, attempt at finding puppies, measuring puppies. The thing that you have to understand is this isn't to say you need to go out and find puppies. This is research. This is done by scientists and grad students and people who are doing this to gather information, you should always, if you would accidentally come across a den, you should never attempt to see those pups. One, you probably aren't gonna get, you could get hurt, you could upset a parent if it's close, but you're gonna upset the parent when they come back and they're gonna have to move all those puppies and it's gonna stress everybody out. So I'm gonna turn this on. You may, uh, your volume personally, I'm not sure if um, uh, it's gonna work. But this is just an example. I say, Chuck, we go where that, that old Petro is, where we've had them in the past. Yeah. 
just see look at there, there's the hedgerow. In the springtime, we go through um, all of our coyotes that we know are breeding. Potentially, they do have a den, and we might be able to find them. And so that's what we were doing today. Is we had a couple of coyotes that we knew either were pregnant or they had really great clusters that they suggested maybe they had a den. So we get uh, telemetry locations, and those are just taken from different bearings over different places along a block, and uh, they basically create a location. So even though we can't see the animal, we know it's at a certain point inside this block. Yeah, I was coming up in the hedgerow, I'll just kind of follow it looking for dens in the roots. They were just kind of lying underneath the, head, the tree, just playing in the dirt. It's like two little fuzzballs. So we do a full. The best fold so far. It'll say three total. Nice belly on her. You know, definitely a female. Uh, we'll pull the young ones out and we'll process them. We'll, we'll take care samples and blood. We'll put a pit tag in them in case we encounter them again. If they're over about three pounds in size, we'll put collars on them, take measurements, photographs, and then put them back in the hole. And uh, Mama will come and take care of them. One of the things I always worry about is um, when people see the pups and they see how cute that is and how neat this work is, you definitely don't want people to try to you know, do that same type of thing or try to approach them. There are still wild animals, and so that's the bottom line you want to make sure people remember. We were just coming in on a, a den site that we had seen pups here the year before, and there were six or seven of them crawling around this old car in the woods and they scattered. We just got to make sure we got everybody. So I thought there were at least seven or so, so we've got six. So we'll check the rest of the junk piles and see what we can find. I got one in here. And some of them lay low. They find, you know, anything they can hide under. And it's pretty crazy there for a while, uh, running around, trying to hold as many as you can and trying to signal people in. It's, every year, this is the, probably one of the best parts of the project is rounding up the pups. One of the greatest things about this research is that it's completely unbiased. Um, we don't operate under any political pressures or any sort of motivation to get a specific um, answer to the things that we're trying to study. And so it's basically just observing and telling it as it is. One of the greatest advantages to having that long of a study is to see those changes over time that you wouldn't get if you did this for a year or two years. They're uh, pretty young teeth. Looking at the teeth, they're at age of, I don't know, three weeks. As an animal we could tag today, we could find in 10 years from now. And that's going to give you a pretty good picture of what's going on. So um, it's definitely looking towards the long term. We'll find the what we think is the active den uh, in the area kind of put them all back in there, keep them together for mom when she comes back and she'll, uh, she'll of course move them and, and the process will go from there. So I'm sure she already has a den lined up. <laughs> so I hope that came through. I couldn't tell for sure. Otherwise you just had a really nice break from listening to me talk to you. The research um, in there, like I said, it's this uh, this project that's been going on, the Urban Coyote Project. It's done in Cook County. Um, uh, Stan is from Ohio State and Chris is the biologist for Cook and he does do more than coyote work, but that's how I know him mostly from. And um, for a while there, I was a kind of a weird groupie because I wanted to hear more and more about what was going on. So I'd go to anything they talked about. Um, there's an estimate of over 2000 coyotes in Cook County. And if you think about that compared to where I live in DeKalb County, we don't have near that many, but they have to travel farther here to find food and they have to, um, work harder to hold territories and their territories would have to be bigger. In, in Cook County, you have, you have so many benefits of structure and water and food that attracts the food you're interested in and gardens that attract rabbits. It's kind of a perfect fit. Um, so the numbers are higher and they have learned these guys, these animals are amazing adaptees. Um, at one point, Chris said that, um, there was a female that raised a whole litter of pups at, um, the football stadium, <laughs> you know, right in the parking lot in a, in some kind of form of a concrete culvert or something. And nobody ever saw her or noticed her. They're very good at taking care of their families. Um, 
but as we've sprawled, so have the coyotes. We've, uh, we've created a great position for them. Uh, clear up to Alaska, pushing, they are pushing that envelope. They are becoming uh, very nocturnal in Cook County, more so than usual, because they're running into people. They don't want to do that. There used to be some great video. I don't know that it's on their current website, but you can get some really neat information there. But, and it was um, go cams. So they were watching and they started noticing that they were, the coyotes were learning to look both ways before they crossed the street. They were, knew which light was the light that's, you know, not by color, but by position, stop the cars. They were looking up at a stoplight. And about a month ago, I left our Farm Bureau building and two coyotes, right? I was talking, they could have looked at me, could have cared less. They walked to one of the busiest roads in DeKalb County. And sure enough, I just was cringing. It was after work traffic. That coyote looked 10 to 12 times, left, right, left, right, continued, found a break, ran for it. They, they adapt and they learn, hence they're successful. Hence people get concerned because that makes us nervous, right? So, um, what they did find with some of the research, uh, many of the animals that get hit by cars that, that are theirs, they have found many of them are already compromised. In the, case, in, in the case of coyotes, many of them are compromised with heartworm. Uh, that can be uh, slow them down, not give them the, the oxygen load to make that burst across the road, whatever it is, and that can be um, difficult. So the special youth collars that they put on these puppies that people get worried because of strangulation, but they have a special ability to grow with them to a certain point. And um, then they also can have a charge built in with a cell phone that can call the number and literally pop the collar. Uh, I remember listening to Chris speak one time and he smiled. It's <clears throat> clearly, it's one of the funnest moments for him is to pop that collar, kind of a Mission Impossible thing. But I said, well, Chris, it's probably not really fun for the pups because <laughs> it's this life's been perfect and all of a sudden something blows around your neck and pops off. And I think that'd be a little scary. I put up here that uh, some places that they had mentioned, the, the project had mentioned they had coyotes living by Ikea. Um, there was a situation by a medical building where they, uh, two workers would walk every night on the path and one of their coyotes would just step off to the side as they passed. And finally they asked them if they ever saw any wildlife and they said, no, uh, the two people said, no, but there is this stray dog that walks by every night. I mean, they're just passing each other closer than we're allowed to pass people today. Um, and no worries, you know, no, no interaction whatsoever. Um, there was a, a animal that um, had passed and they opened the stomach and that animal had 11 rodents whole because they bite and swallow often. Uh, in their small food. That animal had 11 rodents in its stomach and four of them were full-size city rats. So imagine <laughs> 11 rodents and four of them, you know, are like a mini loaf of bread. So they are critically, critically important to our ecological system because of that particular situation, definitely. Um, even though we don't have a, an, a predator above them, minus automobiles, disease, uh, hunting, they are definitely an important part and provide an, what we call an ecological service that without it could be detrimental, especially to places like Chicago and other cities around the nation. Um, we just need to understand and study them. And that's the beauty of this research they are keeping it up to date and they're telling you what they're doing. You have access to that as a community member. It's, it's completely transparent and it helps us see what's happening uh, and what's going on and why do we have research? So we can see when there's changes, so we can see when they learn to do something new. So koi dogs is a, is a concern of many people. And one of the things I heard, I believe Stan was saying, that they have been a pure species for 9,000 years, they're not going anywhere. But here's some of the reasons that if you do get a koi dog, which is a, a domestic dog who breeds with a coyote, here are some of the points that they made. Um, they have dif different um, you know, breeding times, right? So uh, coyotes are highly seasonal, so January prime time for coyote breeding. She's going to come into estrus once a year. He's got he's got to be around that time, you know, that year. They do tend to partner up and, and they are monogamous. Um, so one time a year breeding, unlike a koi dog who has shifted shifted estrus cycles because they're that domestic dog 
um, breeding creates that. And it doesn't coincide um, possibly to that January time, that cold winter time of breeding versus a, a different time of year. Domestic dog and koi dog males don't tend to litters. So if you have a koi dog male with a coyote female, she needs that support to feed all those pups and there's a tendency for them to become compromised. Um, so that also could uh, lead to getting rid of that koi dog factor. Um, and they, they're not so sure that being a koi dog doesn't lower the fertility rate. One of the other things that was shared uh, that you know, we, say, we say animals are monogamous, um, only if we research that particular pair tag them do we know. And it turns out that DNA testing of coyotes are truly monogamous to their mate. If that mate dies, they will find another mate if they still are of, of breeding uh, age and or ability. However, red foxes evidently are the worst. They're listed as monogamous, but uh, yeah, they're not, they're not. <laughs> there must be that gorgeous pelt is an attractant to everybody, but they are not necessarily uh, monogamous. So um, this is a scared animal. Now this was the animal I worked with in Kentucky and people told me how scary he was. And I worked with him and he wasn't because I was one of those two people he allowed to be part of his uh, would-be family. So I covered up in a full, uh, full gear with my camera and army crawled up to his confinement. And that's what I got. So if I saw that in the woods, I would be terrified. I would be thinking I had an animal that was going to definitely come after me, which he could out of fear, but this is not an aggressive animal. Those ears are pinned. His eyes are squinted. He's not snarling. He was terrified. Um, because he didn't know who or what I was. And I think that's important for us to understand that we tend to anthropomorphize or put human feeling into something that we have no idea uh, what that could be about. So finally, um, laws and regulations. There are laws. <laughs> uh, you can hunt legally coyotes year round during deer season you are not supposed to hunt coyote unless you don't fill your deer tag in which case you can use your deer tag to um, hunt coyote so technically 365 days a year uh, you can hunt them trapping is fall and winter they do this to protect breeding season and pup season um, and i added a weird note but it's important for you to understand when you want people to do something about something birds are owned by the federal government if you harm a bird except for about three species of birds that's a federal crime. <laughs> um, if you want somebody to fix something and do something about a certain bird population, that's a, that's a, they're controlled, um, managed by federal government rules, whereas all the other animals are regulated by the state they're in. So if you're concerned about coyotes in Illinois, that would be Illinois Department of Natural Resources concern, not a federal concern. So I just want that clarified um, because some people, want something done and that's that's the situation with who who takes care of who really quickly the difference between preservation conservation and management preservation would be like a forest preserve you maintain it you protect it you try to keep it as close to the way it is to uh, have it there uh, for length of time conservation careful preservation and protection of something with plan management so you're adding a little bit of that plan management in there you're trying to keep it the way it is um, but you're having to do a little more with it. Um, the preservation of a physical quantity uh, might be conservation. Um, I mentioned the apex predators, the big ones that I talked about earlier. And then finally, management. The actor skill of controlling and making decisions about a species, the actor process of deciding how to maintain that species. This is what we need with coyotes. We need management for the species. You'll never get rid of them. And actually doing certain actions could be a problem. Um, do they bite people? They have. They've not, um, in Illinois, um, the most recent and one of the very few um, was the child injured over by the zoo and that animal turned out to have an injury. Um, there was an incident uh, some years back about a, a child and the father on the, on the news said, I told him to give the puppy a starburst. So he unwrapped a starburst for the child to give the coyote puppy a starburst turns out it by by saliva testing it was a pup it was a wild puppy like a dog a domestic dog and then there was a man who had been attacked in an alley and said a coyote attacked him and they dna tested and it was a dog we're quick to blame 
very quick to blame. So we just have to be careful about that and get, and in the, the Coyote Project did a study, I believe it was 80, 85, 1985 to 2006, and there were 100, nationally 142 coyote um, bites, attacks, um, and over a third of those, and they think even more, were related to coyotes who were being fed on purpose or incidentally in the area where they did end up biting somebody. So not feeding these animals is gonna be a really, really important thing um, and not leaving food out. The rural numbers, what are we gonna expect, are gonna be fewer than urban. Urban offers too many opportunities for an opportunistic generalist animal like this. If an individual does become accustomed to livestock, in other words, accustomed meaning eating ducks, chickens, it does need to be eliminated. It will continue to train that on into their family, um, most likely, um, but you never want to kill a coyote that's not doing anything wrong. And that's the biggest, the, the biggest thing. If that coyote is in, if your home and landscape is in their territory and nothing's happening, your chickens are left alone, your ducks are left alone, um, let that animal be because that's his territory and he's not interested because if you take him out that territory becomes unowned and then anybody passing through has access to do what they want on that territory and if you get a duck killer or a chicken killer a, you know a barn cat killer now you've opened that up we call it a predator sink because they all can come in there and i want to add too that cats yes coyotes do take cats um barn cats you know, it's easy, but I have to point out that great horned owls don't mind a cat. So not a big fat cat like the one in my house, but some of our barn cats who are a little, you know, more slender, lighter weight, skunk size, because great horned owls, they love skunk. It's the right size for their effort. So we blame a lot on coyotes and sometimes we might want to take a step back and think about what else might be the answer. Um, numbers rise and fall with food and disease. That makes sense probably. And they're going to be dis, uh, successful despite us. If you have a community uh, concern, I use this, it's the cover of the city of Wheaton's coyote policy. Every city, any, every urban area really should have a coyote policy developed with community members involved because this is always going to happen. You know, there's always going to be some human interaction. And I apologize, there's a small dog in my house, um, not a coyote. And that human, that interaction needs to be have a plan and if other if everyone was involved in the plan and it comes down to this animal needs to be removed uh destroyed you can turn to that plan it was a thought out plan it made sense but they had an issue up in madison a couple years ago with a, a coyote that was going after uh people's dogs specifically and uh, um, causing a lot of problems and they 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 were saying oh it must be a group of coyotes and such and such and some of us chimed in and said, it's probably a single animal. It just tends to be how it happens, you know, that somebody gets, goes rogue and uh, that has gotten quiet. I haven't found the information yet to see what happened. But if you are a, a person who, um, you know, project wise, this is a really, this is a great project and everybody should have one. And in Northern Illinois, especially in the Northwest corner, if anybody's out there, you probably should have a policy in place for the random uh, cougar that's walking through, the bears that are walking through up here occasionally. So everybody's aware of the plan. And then you, you have a much more uh, community ownership uh, when something has to happen. What's your role? You're the manager of the coyote. We don't have any cougars or wolves taking them out. Co wolves still eat coyotes for territorial reasons. They don't have anybody, right? So no access to food or access to food by rodents who then attract. Uh, these guys, no handouts. One gentleman was bit by a coyote, but he was feeding the coyote and decided he'd fed it long enough he should be allowed to pet it. And then it bit his hand and never came back. So you can't, these are wild animals and we have to treat them as such. Um, be responsible with your pet ownership, right? Don't bend over and, and look like you want to play and talk nice to them. It's all of our responsibility to scare them. They should see a human and think fear, right? To keep them safe from us having to harm them later. Uh, so keep your body language uh, forward and aggressive. Um, one of the things that, you know, we see the, I will add, I have a small dog, you just heard him, and we have a fenced-in yard at, in, on a field, as I spoke earlier. 
if anyone, if any small dog in this neighborhood is going to get taken out by a coyote, it's that one. Because he goes out the back door and just starts barking before he even gets across the threshold for no reason into the dark fenced in yard. I now, because he's 13, put him on a leash at night because he's going to invite a coyote into this yard. The coyote doesn't want to eat him. One of the things we notice, yes, there have been attacks on bigger dogs, especially during breeding season and pup season and territorial purposes, um, most likely. But the little dogs, they, quite frankly, I think they annoy them. And they go out at night barking. You don't bark when you're looking for food. You're quiet till you're full. And our little dogs, like mine, go out and ay 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 right? We don't think that the coyote should be mad. The coyote doesn't understand why there's a canine breaking canine rule at that level. Some of them can't take the bite that they get to be quiet, but oftentimes the coyotes are trying to get them to be quiet. They're biting like, be quiet. You, you must stop that. They bite their own. If they were hunting in a family group and the kids were old enough to go and they let out a bark, they'd probably knock them over and bite them. Be quiet right? So, and you know they're not hunting little dogs to eat them because you see them on the news after they've been quote-unquote attacked and they're still alive. They're trying to most likely to get them to quiet down, right, and not draw attention <laughs> to them. And yes, there's plenty of incidents where um, it's, they do are interested and or go after. I'm not saying they don't, but a lot of times it's because of that, that action. It's another canine and they don't understand that type of canine. Some of the resources from today, just I had to put them in there and the new Living with Wildlife, uh, Living with Illinois Wildlife, you will get there from the Living with Illinois Wildlife uh, U of I uh, site. It's now, um, we're now still involved in it, but it's down with uh, the National uh, rivers group uh, down south and now if you just put in wildlifeillinois.org it'll get you there too. And finally I added this in science literacy meaning your knowledge is the vaccine against the charlatans of the world the media that would love to exploit your ignorance use what you've heard today do some more research on the urban coyote project so when people get excited you can bring um, bring it to a level of conversation that yes if he's naughty he'll have to go if he's not doing anything this is why at this time of year they're howling. This is uh, possibly um, what those family interactions are about with feeding and excitement. Uh, try to share that information. It's important. Um, I do um, want to thank you. There's one more slide with the information for the next um, very awesome webinar, but I do want to thank you for listening to all that. Um, I talked as quickly as I could, hopefully not too fast. This is re being recorded and will be available at some point uh, in a few weeks to, to hear again if you missed points or wanna write something down. Um, and I would, I'm would i just very, very excited to get to share this in this new weird world of Zoom, not my usual platform as many of my master naturalists know. And yes, for my master naturalists, I'm talking with my hands extremely. So I am not just sitting here calmly, I get a little excited. And this is the, um, the screen. This is our next planting for the pollinators with one of my favorite uh, professionals on our team, Erin Garrett. She's the one that was helping me try to manage this crazy thing. And there's a QR code. If you have a QR code on your phone, a reader, you can just use that. Uh, the same information is on the URL right there. And uh, I will leave that up while we, uh, I think I can leave it up, Erin. Um, now it's up to you to tell me. Um, what I can answer in the few minutes we have left. And remember that you can reach me um, at PS, P as in Peggy, S as in Sue, Doty, D-O-T-Y, P-S, Doty at Illinois.edu. That's my email. And so we aren't gonna get a lot of questions answered today. However, um, please feel free to reach out and have a conversation. All right, great. I did just put Peggy's email into the chat box to make it easier. Um, if you weren't able to get that. But thank you, Peggy. We do have some questions that have come in. Um, and so we'll try to go through those as quickly as we can. I know, sorry. That's okay. No, it was great. Um, so we'll start. We had quite a few questions on koi dogs. Mm -hmm. So first, if you could just clarify um, what a koi dog is and ah. then how common they are. So the koi dog, I'll go back to that page too. Hopefully you can see it. Koi dogs are a mix between a domestic dog 
and a coyote. So when a coyote has um, decided to, on its own, to diversify itself and goes out and breeds, and it can be male or female. And so the other parent would be then a domestic dog. So it's just a combination. They are not very common because they don't, because of these, cons, these um, points that are made on the slide, they, they, they can successfully breed, but if it's the male that is the domestic dog, the female doesn't have the uh, support to feed the babies, so you could lose the babies that way and not have them. If any of those young uh, were able to get to adulthood, um, they may have lower fertility, they may go into season and then be bred with a domestic, you know, the domestic dog back with another domestic dog and thin that back out again. Um, they just haven't ever, I think when people see a taller coyote, they just assume it's a koi dog. And because they look like small German shepherds, they do, they look minus the nose and some of them are a little husky. They may have even a thicker nose. We just assume, I think my personality is such to say, wow, I wonder if that one could be part German Shepherd. I mean, we never see a koi dog that's a Sharpe, right? That's all wrinkled. Um, we don't see a, you know, any smaller breed or a Basset coyote. I think it's our tendency to see it as a dog versus a coyote. Great. Okay. Um, there was also a question that if a koi dog is spayed or neutered, does that remove any problems? I assume if you had a koi dog. If you had a koi dog and, and you spayed or neutered it, it could no longer reproduce at all. Um, it doesn't mean like if you knew somehow for sure that you had a half koi, coyote, half dog animal, it doesn't mean that you might, when it became mature, get some of the personality traits of a wild animal, in which case they need, you know, it's a leadership issue. It's a who's in charge. The minute, you know, the minute they don't, they need a leader. They need an alpha mom alpha dad, you know, um, they need that mom or dad role. If you aren't that role, you could see some, some misbehaviors, a, a lot more nipping, maybe some aggression, um, if they would show that, that genetic portion of their, of their uh, animal. And that's not me speaking as a veterinarian, that's just me speaking of, you know, if you've got genetics for a wild animal in, in another animal, you, you'd have that potential. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we had a question if do larger animals such as cougars follow smaller animals in hunting for food such as in sharing the hunt? No, I'm well, I don't know. Cougars tend to be more solitary. When we see cougars walking through Illinois, it's usually in the spring because the mom's about to have new kits and she basically raises those cougars for two years and then says, get out, <laughs> you need to go. And they're usually out of the Black Hills of the Dakotas. <clears throat> it's hard to find a territory when the territory is like 70, 70 square mile minimum. Um, so a family group hunt, maybe, right? Um, and in the in the coyotes, what's funny is they, they can't get organized to save their soul. So if a mouse goes this way, the one goes that way, I'm going over here. And that's why they howl and find each other. The excitement you hear, a lot of people think when they hear coyotes at night, all of a sudden getting really excited that they're killing something. I'm, we, I don't know why we as humans, and I've done it too, want it to be scarier, right? T probably they've come together and have food to share that's already been caught or may even be regurgitated one more time for pups, right? So it's a, it's an, it's a response to the excitement of sharing the energy that's going to pass on through their body, you know, really more than, more than a ganging up on, but cougars are independent. Cougars, if you, cougars are the one animal, I would say, uh, large predator wise, you need to stay in eyesight of that animal. They, if they walk off looking like they're just walking away, you need to know where they are and never have your back that direction. They, they are, <laughs> they're just too good of a hunter compared to a coyote. Okay, um, we, so based on that, I think we know the answer to this one, but someone asked, I was told that coyotes might work together to lure pets or dogs away from the home. Is there any truth to that? And I'll piggyback another question, if cats mm -hmm. are prey for coyotes. If cats are what? Prey for coyotes. Yeah, you know, my personal theory is cats taste good. 
I'm just going to put it out there because cats tend to disappear. But again, don't forget, great horned owls like cats too. I've seen feather debris from a great horned owl in my neighbor's garage and uh, the kittens were, were not all there anymore. And they were feathers from a great horned owl. And I'm like, oh, it's not just coyotes and foxes and things. Um, the ganging up thing, I've heard it so many times and I've heard it from personal witness. So I'm not going to say it it doesn't happen what I would say it's not it's not year-round common my theory would be personally that it's during breeding season and they want to get as many animals out of their territory as they can that replicate a canine um, there is nothing to support that other than being 55 years old and loving these animals for a very long time does it happen probably because I've heard enough people tell me personally that they felt that's what was going on. You also might get the lure of, of, of an animal who's deciding that he wants to not hang out with coyotes and wants to breed to your female dog if they're not spayed, right? And then they're in heat. Um, but the, it, I would guess that getting super territorial may cause them to try to want that animal off their territory, but they are not as likely to take on a large dog alone they're, they're kind of smarter than that, but the two alphas, the mom and the dad might say, okay, we got to get rid of this animal. It's, it keeps walking out, you know, here into this now our space. I hope that answers that. But yeah, the cat thing, you guys, I'm pretty sure because we don't find the cats that something, something is, you know, not always, sometimes they go off and they get injured or trapped somewhere. Um, but yeah, I think if my dog went outside, um, they would just bite him to make him quiet but I never hear of much of that being to eat them. It's more of a behavior to protect territory. And I would guess it's more this time of year, um, winter and, and spring when there's babies and they're more worried about their family, stuff like that. All right, great. So for the interest of time, we're not able to answer all of the questions. So again, if you are very curious, please don't hesitate to reach out to Peggy. But I do want to close with one question because I've gotten it a couple times. Um, mm -hmm. Is if you come across a coyote when you're out hiking in the woods, what should you do? Oh, don't do what I would do, which would be like, oh, you're so beautiful, right? That's wrong. You need, to, I personally, if I were telling everybody and if I did what I say, um, I would whistle. I'm a good whistler. You know, I'd whistle really loud with my fingers. I would yell, scream, and freak them out because the next person that comes down that trail, another human, that animal's more likely to go, yeah, they're crazy. I'm staying out of the way, right? Um, you don't want to chase it, obviously, and make it feel like you're trying to attack, and you don't want to turn around and run because then they're like, wow, that was kind of fun and interesting, and I'd like to see that happen again because they are very comical. Um, you want to do your best to be the best manager of coyotes because, again, like I said, we are their managers. So put your arms up, act crazy, don't be afraid, right? Um, I say that, that's easy to say when you're sitting here at a desk, but don't be intimidated, be loud, you know, like get out of here, you know, and you're doing it not for you as much as you're doing it for the next person. All right, thank you so much. And at this time, we're gonna stop the recording and end our presentation for today. So we wanna thank Peggy again very, very much. Please consider doing the evaluation and we hope that you will join us next week and um, the following weeks for the continuation of the Everyday Environment webinars. And that will be Erin who's speaking to you right now and it's gonna be amazing. So please join us. <laughs>